Major funding for these broadcasts is made possible by grants from Capital One Bank and Chase Commercial Term Lending, the Whitcoff Group, New York Community Bank, MNT Bank, Greenberg Traurig, Perfect Building Maintenance, Genova Burns. Additional funding is provided by grants from AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Aerial Property Advisors, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Layumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Citizens Bank, Colliers International NYC, CPEX Real Estate Services, Cushman and Wakefield, Customers Bank, DDG, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Fisher Brothers, First Nationwide Title Agency, Flushing Bank, Foley and Lardner, Friedman, Handler Real Estate Organization, HAP Investment Developers, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, Chairman US Realty.com, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Matone Group, Mercantile Commerce Bank, NA, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Grubnight Frank, New Banks, MHP Real Estate Services, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rosewood Realty Group, SJP Properties, Sterling National Bank, Sterling Risk, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, The Continuum Company, The CUNY TV Foundation, The Moynian Group, and These Friends. Orphanage, the Holocaust, maybe I'll be a writer, maybe I'll be a lawyer. Nah, I'm going to follow medical school. Virologist, microbiologist, defection to, Amer to Vienna, to America, NYU Medical Center, then a creation of a drug called Remicade. Not a drug, a miracle drug saving people's lives and saving them from Crohn's, colitis, and rheumatoid arthritis. I have the legendary Dr. Jan Vosek here today. Thanks for being here. Thank you. It's nice to, to be here with you. So tell me about your grandparents first and a little history of the family. So my, my mother's parents uh, uh, came from Austria from the part of Austria that borders on Hungary. And they moved to, to Budapest, the, the capital of Hungary, long before the First World War, uh, and uh, continued to actually speak German because uh, uh, in Austria they, they, they spoke German. Uh, and then uh, my mother was born in, in, in Budapest, uh, uh, and went to school there. And as a, when she was a teenager, uh, after the uh, end of the First World War, uh, her parents moved to what was then newly formed Czechoslovakia, to the city of Bratislava, because my grandfather worked for an Austrian bank, and they were opening a branch in Bratislava, and they, they moved him there. My father's family um, lived in what is now Slovakia, but before the First World War, it was a, a part of Hungary, the Kingdom of Hungary and part of the Austro-Hungarian uh, Empire. Uh, so they lived in Slovakia and uh, owned a dry goods store. and. Um, when my father was uh, about 10 years old, uh, his parents decided to pack up and move to Budapest. S Slovakia and, and, and Budapest somehow played a role in, in, in both my mother's and my, my father's family. And uh, then my father, 
who was drafted during the First World War, after the end of the First World War, decided to move back to his country of birth, which in the meantime became uh, Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia. Now, your mother was very interesting because your mother uh, went to medical school. Um, she Indeed. Was, and uh, talk about your mother, uh, and she became an ophthalmologist also. Yes, yeah, so um, it was highly unusual in her days for uh, women to, to go to medical school. She, she told me that there were only three uh, women in a class of, I think, 150 or so. Um, so she was, she was really exceptional. Uh, and she went to medical school in Bratislava, which was Czechoslovakia, and indeed became an ophthalmologist. And she was a very beautiful, even uh, from the days that, that I remember. Uh, but she was also a very ambitious woman. Uh, she had a good education. As I read in the book that you're publishing, um, it, was, it was an arranged marriage that the, somebody may, it may have been some type of introduction for the two of them. I never really found out the full details of how they met, but I came to the conclusion that it was an arranged marriage because um, uh, there was a yeah, difference yeah. in age. It was like an 11-year difference the, in age. In age also. My mother was 21, and she was still a medical student when, when she got married. And uh, even though she didn't tell me the whole story, um, she told me that her parents lost money during the Depression in the 1930s. And she didn't really tell me in, in so many words. Now, your father worked for... He was a self-made man. He worked for a large company that owned coal mines and worked his way up and became reasonably prosperous. He was not uh, super rich, but uh, well-to-do. Uh, it's 1938, because of what's happening in, you know, with the Nazis over there. Uh, your mother decides to convert to Catholicism, correct? Yes. What's the situation with the orphanage? So um, when, when the Nazis took, took over, um, even though my mother con converted and had me uh, baptized as well, that really did not protect us because the, the anti-Jewish laws were based not on religion but on, on, on race. So she was, uh, and I was considered, Jewish, and uh, uh, in the early 1940s, uh, the uh, pro-Nazi government that uh, took over in Slovakia, Czechoslovakia was crushed by Hitler, and then Slovakia became a satellite uh, country of uh, uh, Nazi Germany, and they issued laws that were very similar to the, to the Nuremberg laws in, in Germany, and uh, these laws prohibited Jewish children from attending regular schools. Um, it, that was the beginning. So um, in, in theory, my mother uh, was supposed to put me in a, in a Jewish school, but she didn't want to do that because uh, it, it was already clear that uh, right. Jews will be sent to concentration camps. To, so to protect me, uh, she placed me in a, in a Catholic orphanage. So when you were at the orphanage, which you were taught not by the nuns, you said to me you were taught by the priests, the, the orphanage was very close to where your mother and father were living, that you would go home on the weekends or at nights even once in a while. Uh, that's correct. Uh, as I, I, I recall, I, I would go home on, on, on weekends. Uh, um, maybe not initially... Uh, because initially my parents were afraid that uh, they would be rounded up and sent to concentration camps. And then for a while, and, you know, that's... Uh, so what happens uh, in 1944? Uh, first of all, in 1943, uh, my mother, even though she was Jewish, but because she was a physician and they needed physician, they sent her to a small town in 
central Slovakia. Uh, and my mother decided at that point to take me out of the orphanage because in Slovakia for about two years uh, the government stopped uh, deporting Jews into concentration camps. They rounded up about two-thirds of the Jews living in Slovakia, sent them mostly to Auschwitz, and the majority of, of those people did not survive the war. But the one-third that remained for a while was left in relative peace. There were still anti-Jewish laws, but at least they were not being deported to concentration camps. So during this time, she took me to this small town in central Slovakia, and I was able to attend regular school in that town. That was, again, some kind of an anomaly. Right. But then it was 44, and your father has to leave. In 44. Even though your father had converted, like, in 1941, but that was not considered the, the proper conversion. Right. So in 1944, there was an uprising against uh, the Germans and the Nazis in Slovakia. At that point, the German army uh, occupied Slovakia. And um, we were initially, my mother and I, living in the part that was controlled by the, uh, the, the uh, anti-Nazi uh, elements in, in Slovakia. And my father was able to join us there. But that didn't last too long because uh, the German army was still strong enough to suppress the, the uprising, and we had to go into hiding. Right. It's 1945. The war is coming to an end. So tell me the story of how your mother and you were driving and you met your father. So uh, we lived in, in a, a small village for a, in, a, in, in hiding for about uh, seven or eight months. And then uh, the Russian army came uh, and uh, that for us was uh, uh, liberation uh, because suddenly we didn't have to hide any longer, and a few days after uh, the, the Russian army arrived, my mother uh, decided that we will go to the nearest uh, town where she um, before used to practice uh, ophthalmology. Uh, but there was no transportation, so we were um, partly hitchhiking on some Russian army trucks and partly walking, and at one moment we were just standing at the side of the road, not knowing what to, what to do. And suddenly, a, a, a car, a, a civilian car, uh, stopped. And out of that car came my father. So that was a, a, a really a memorable moment, because we didn't know whether he was alive. We didn't, he didn't know whether we were alive. And suddenly, we were now, reunited. Now, now, what's interesting after that, you know, as you said to me, you know, you were thinking maybe you'd like to be a writer or you'd like to be a lawyer, but there was no place in that society for a writer or a lawyer, and your parents really had a, a desire that they wanted you to go to medical school. That, that's correct. Um, so they, they wanted me to go to medical school. I resisted the idea partly because, uh, you know, I, I didn't want... As a, as a teenager to follow in my, my mother's uh, path. So it was, you know, partly being a little rebellious. Uh, but also I was always interested in literature and writing. But as you said, um, in, in a communist system, uh, being a journalist or a writer uh, was, was really not uh, very attractive for someone who didn't believe in in, in communism, and then in, in, in the end, uh, uh, just uh, as I remember it, one day before the deadline uh, for, for the submission of the application, I decided to submit an application to medical school, and I was accepted. Now, medical school at that time in, in, in Europe over there was six years. And that is correct. It still, it still is, and you, you, there is no college between high school and medical school. So you, you, you finish high school uh, and you go straight into, into medical school. And the first two 
years of medical school, a little like college here. Right. How do you, when you were in medical school, get involved with microbiology, which subsequently was Remicade and all the well, this was uh, things that you've partly done. serendipity. Uh, uh, when I was um, a second year medical student, I volunteered for a research project that uh, was advertised for for medical student and that research project had to do with the resistance of some bacteria to penicillin. I, I, I liked that project for, for some reason. Penicillin was still kind of a magic word in those days. And uh, I fell in love with uh, doing laboratory research. And uh, by the time I finished my second year in medical school, I knew that's really what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. So you finished medical school in what, 1957? 57. And you meet your, your wife, who you got married to in 1962, who was an art uh, historian. Yes. Uh, and what's happening, it's the communist regime, but you had met somebody during one of your trips from Vienna. It was actually a professional colleague, professional who, came colleague. To, who came to Bratislava, and we became Be good became friends. friends. But a couple of years prior to that, your wife's brother, uh, Eric? Ivan. Ivan. Uh, Ivan defected to America via Egypt. He was in a trip to Egypt. And you and your wife were talking about the idea of defection. But the biggest problem was to get a visa for a husband and wife was next to impossible, as you were saying to me. Correct, correct. And you, you and your wife applied for a visa to meet your friends in Vienna, and the day before, or two days before, you get the phone call. Tell me about the phone call. So when we applied for the visa, we didn't believe that uh, we would get the permission to leave because uh, it was really very difficult for a husband and wife, and we didn't have children, uh, which made it even more difficult to, to be allowed to visit a Western country together. Um, but then we did get the permission to go, and um, uh, if, if, a few days before departure, I, I met work in, I was working uh, at, at the research institute uh, in, for virology, so I I was uh, working on, with viruses, and I get this phone call from Vienna. My technician came, you have a phone call from Vienna, which was very unusual in the days of communism to get a phone call uh, from a Western country. Uh, so I said, oh my God, uh, uh, my colleague uh, who invited me is probably canceling his invitation. Instead, he said, uh, I have tickets for the opera. Bring Can you tuxedo. bring a tuxedo? <laughs> Your mother and father had a piece of land prior to this. They sold the land and they had money for a car. Now, you knew that you couldn't bring much clothing and you couldn't bring any money, um, but you were planning this and you didn't even tell your, you told your parents, but you didn't tell your wife's parents, your father, her, her father who you live with. So subsequently you get to Vienna and your friends take you in. And, but part of the plan was to come to America, but Ivan was on vacation, right? That is correct, yes. He was in Mexico and we couldn't reach him for over two weeks, uh, uh, which, of course, complicated our plans because uh, we, we, couldn't take, uh, we couldn't take any money from, from uh, Czechoslovakia and we had to then borrow money from strangers. But somehow, somehow we managed uh, and until he got back from his vacation. Now, because you had known all these people over the years who you had kept in touch with, with these postcards and other things, you had... You had three opportunities. Two of them were in New York. Uh, one was where Ivan was working because he was an anesthesiologist at the NYU Medical Center. One was at Cornell. Right. And one was in Philadelphia. Yes, uh, at the Children's uh, Hospital. But your wife said to you what? She, she gave you a couple of... Well, uh, she, she preferred New York. Actually, we both preferred living in New York. Uh, uh, first of all, because uh, her brother lived here, which would make our 
our beginnings uh, easier and we knew that New York was a cosmopolitan city and it probably would be easier for us to get adjusted um, uh, easier than in some, some other parts of the country. But also the professional offer that I received from NYU was the most attractive. Uh, they offered me a, a faculty position uh, and, and even uh, some relocation money, I think. I yes, that's right. Yes. So you come to NYU, you find an apartment across the street on 32nd Street and 2nd Avenue, and then you walk into the office and you say to the head of the department, where are the things? And he says, learn how to write a grant, right? Right. So they, they showed me an, an empty uh, space, which was going to be my... My, my laboratory and adjacent office, but there was no equipment. And as you said, when I said, well, how, how can I uh, do, do research without having any equipment? He said, well, you know, that's America. Um, you sit down, you write, write uh, your grant applications, and when you get the money, you can get equipment, you can hire collaborators, and that's what uh, everybody does in this so, country. So when you came over, this is 1960... Five. 65. Um, you come over, you start working on programs with interferon, but the, the major involvement where the Remicade and everything was in 1982, uh, right? When you, uh, mm, well, um, in the, in the uh, mid-1980s, mm. uh, I, I somewhat switched my research interests, and that's what uh, then eventually led to, to my contribution to the development of Remicade. Okay, now explain to, to my viewers in a simple manner what Remicade was and how you found the, the Crohn's patient and the arthritis patient over there, especially with the film of the walking down. So uh, Remicade um, is a, a, a medicine, a, a, a therapeutic drug uh, that um, inhibits uh, a protein produced in the body uh, which is the basis for many inflammatory diseases and autoimmune diseases. And what uh, we did um, um, my, with a colleague in my, in my laboratory, John Ming Lee, uh, we produced uh, what is called a monoclonal antibody, an artificial antibody that can block the action of this protein in the body. Uh, the protein, by the way, is called TNF, um, which is an abbreviation, but I right. don't have to explain that. So, so what subsequently happened in the mid-90s, you found the Michael Wall, uh, sent a core, uh, and you, 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 you produced this, but two of the main tests that were done was one was a patient who couldn't walk and after they were treated. So Remicade has been valuable in rheumatoid arthritis and Crohn's. And so Crohn's initially, we thought that um, this, this drug could be useful in the treatment of sepsis, which is a very severe uh, condition, often fatal, resulting from severe infection. Uh, when uh, the biotechnology company we worked with, Centocor, um, uh, organized a clinical trial to see whether the drug is indeed effective, it turned out that even though it didn't harm the patients, it didn't help them. So at that point, we thought perhaps that's the end of the road, and, and we really didn't know what, what uh, to do next. And unfortunately, uh, Two colleagues in, in London, uh, an immunologist, Mark Feldman, and a rheumatologist, uh, Ravinder Maini, uh, convinced Centocor to let them use uh, Remicade. It actually wasn't called Remicade yet at right. the, in those days. Uh, in an, what is called open trial in, in 20 patients with very severe rheumatoid arthritis. And, and subsequently the, uh, the Crohn's and colitis. And so, and, and, and these initial trials, even though they were not properly controlled, by say properly controlled, right. but, but it was obvious that the patients got, right. got better. I, and I, then uh, a, a, another uh, physician in Holland 
uh, tried uh, the, the drug in, in, a, in one patient first with uh, Crohn's disease and then several other patients. And there again, it, 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 it produced a very, very significant improvement. Remicade has been called the miracle drug. The, the sales volume has been close to $9 billion, I believe. Uh, yes. In excess of $9 billion. But part of it has been helpful because you, being part of the research team in NYU, were able to share in the benefits of this, of this drug. And you gave back to NYU a number of years ago. You made the large, at that time, the largest gift ever made to NYU, sharing a portion of your royalties on that product. That, that, is, that is correct. I'm very fortunate that I was, I was able to, to do it, and I'm very happy that I was right. able to Right, and then, then another important situation that happened later on was that you and your wife created the foundation. Yes, the, the Vilcek Foundation, and the main mission of the Vilcek Foundation is to raise public awareness of the contribution of immigrants to the United States, especially in uh, science and the arts. And what we do is that we give annual prizes to outstanding individuals who made important contributions uh, to this country in uh, science and the arts, but were born outside the United States. Now, 2013, the president gave you an award, right? That is correct, yes. Uh, I uh, was selected to receive the National Medal of Technology and Innovation, which is, uh, together with the National Medal of Science, the, the highest recognition that uh, this country gives to scientists. So I, I am very, very grateful for, for that. So today, in addition to the foundation where you and your wife are actively involved, on a day-to-day -day basis. You're, you're also still a professor of microbiology at the NYU Langone Medical Center, NYU School of Medicine. And what we're fortunate is that you didn't go into literature or law, that you became a wonderful uh, microbiologist and virologist. Well, I'm <laughs> very happy with my, my choice, obviously. Uh, if there is something that I owe to the communists, it's probably the fact that I went to medical school. Who knows what I would have done if I had been growing up in a free society. I am so happy to have you today, and thanks for being here today. Thank you, Michael. My pleasure.